Hey YouTube, Joe Boy here. So, One Piece chapter 1096 is out. If you guys haven't checked out that chapter yet, I suggest that you do so because I will be spoiling you. But now that you have, let's begin. These are the chapters where it is incredibly natural to have a one hour long review. If anybody comes out here with a 10 minute review this week, just, you know, automatic unsubscribe because there is just no way. Sorry, man, you come in with that this week and, and you're done. I'm cutting you off. But geez, guys, flashbacks and One Piece. I said this last week, say this again this week, Oda has never missed. He could try to miss and still fail. 25 years of straight fire. His ability to draw out emotion with just simple snapshots is is unparalleled. Like this is legitimately a talent. You, I don't think that you can learn this. You just have to feel it. And it's just one of those things that puts into perspective the amount of abilities you know, Oda really needed in order to create One Piece. You know, there's just so many little things that add up together to create this. And it's just so unlikely. Of course, to address the elephant in the room, a lot of us were really hopeful that this would become the God Valley flashback. But you know, honestly guys, the more that I sat with it, the more I realized like there's just no way that that's the case. This is, this is specific to Kuma and Bonnie. And there's no reason to dovetail into Rox and Roger if it's not truly relevant to Kuma himself. And I never thought that it was. Like he may have been there, but that's a different story. So honestly guys, I'm just sitting here thankful that we got anything at all. If we're being real with each other, this flashback was always leading up into Kuma losing himself, right? Kuma and Sorbet, Kuma and his relationship with Bonnie. These are, should be the big moments of Kuma's individual flashback. Kuma and Vegapunk, Kuma and the Revolutionaries, now Kuma and Saturn. And after this chapter, you're like, okay, yeah, that's where this is going. So feet firmly planted back in reality. Am I disappointed at all? No, not at all. What we actually got, the flashback itself, relative to Kuma as a character is just incredible. It just is. But yeah, this chapter has so many little details that I, I'm just gonna start from the beginning because that's, it's just easier that way. Obviously we begin where we left off after the last chapter, continuing Kuma's flashback in God Valley. The cleansing festival or the murder festival is underway. And we get to see those celestial dragons a little bit more playing their little game. Obviously in the last chapter, we knew that Figurlin Garling was going to play a big role. We know this regardless because it's already been explained to us that Garling is the champion of God Valley. I presume that to be true. So I, I guess he wins the game, even though it's really unclear about the timeline of this chapter and uh, how much time has passed. But it seems like Oda decided to foreshadow God's Knights here. Introduce some more characters and designs. Part of me is really hyped about this, but also part of me is a little bit confused about how the God's Knights actually work or what they are. Because we see here, they're all basically the same age. They all appear to be children. You know, are not children, that's not accurate, but they're all young, and I think that you can presume that the God's Knights in this chapter are the same God Knights that we're going to meet later in the story, so 40 years has passed. Now they're all old. And I just want to know how this position is selected for. I want to throw a really unlikely theory at you guys. I actually don't believe this to be true. I think it would be cool regardless. Uh, but yeah, don't don't assume that this is actually going to happen. But it's just interesting that we've learned in recent chapters, it's may be possible to become a celestial dragon without having been originally from one of the families, an actual descendant. This is what the York Vegapunk was asking for. And it truly makes me wonder whether or not this has ever happened. You've got to admit that Oda draws the celestial dragons pretty consistently the same way, uh, with rare exception, the Gorosei being one of those exceptions. The other exception is God's Knight. They don't wear the traditional bubble helmet of all the other celestial dragons, which separates them. And it almost feels like they see themselves as less celestial dragon than the others. Or for whatever reason, they're a little less part of the clique. And this is just something that you have to bear in mind. If it were to be true that York could become a celestial dragon, the only way that that would make sense is if York was adopted by one of the 20 families because all the celestial dragons, they have to be descendant of these particular families. That's what makes them celestial dragons. So for this theory to work, Garling and the others would have to be adopted. Celestial dragons in the story really have no reason to pursue individual physical power because they don't need to. Everything is taken care of for them. So it just kind of makes sense to me in a weird way for every family to adopt a sort of mercenary baby, which becomes representative of their family's might. But yeah, I suppose the other reason why this was a thought that occurred to me is one of the God's Knights wears a, a gas mask, which is similar to one of the orphans from Sheep's House, a Big Mom's flashback. The masks are practically identical, aside from the fact that the God's Knight 
person actually has a number on his. So I do wonder whether Oda is trying to communicate something with these two designs being really similar, like suggesting the origin of the God's Knights. Like the character from Big Mom's flashbacks, maybe they were some version of orphans. This could also have a, a role to play with Shanks' story in the future. If Shanks is actually the son of or relative of Figgerlin Garling, and Figgerlin Garling wasn't a true celestial dragon, then, you know, it just makes that story interesting. So yeah, if this were to ever be true, we would obviously need it to come up in the story in some way. Like some character would actually need to be recruited. Maybe if you earn the respect of the Gorosei, this is something that could happen. So I wonder if this might become the future for a character like Rob Lucci. For whatever reason, it just seems like a possibility with Lucci. I'm not sure if I can really explain why, but Lucci gives me God Knight sort of vibes. He reminds me a lot of Figurling Garling. But yeah, I just wanted to throw this thought out into the abyss because uh, there's something unique and interesting about the God's Knights here that, you know, I'm just trying to understand. But yeah, let's not get too lost here. The God's Knights are still a really exciting element of the story, and Oda's at peak design form right now. They looked incredibly cool. But then we pan over to Navy HQ, and we see Kong finally do something when Kong was likely Fleet Admiral having a conversation with Garp. There is so, so much to read into all of this, and I still feel like I'm trying to figure it out. Otto was like cleverly deceptive in all of this. But first things first, it's implied that the Celestial Dragons stole something from Hachinosu or Pirate Island. It's called the Crown Jewel of Pirate Island. It is not explained how they obtained this, nor is it explained what this actually is, but I presume that we're supposed to assume that this is a devil fruit. For instance, like Kaido's devil fruit. But I actually don't think that that's particularly likely. Are we supposed to assume that there was just a devil fruit sitting on Pirate Island that nobody chose to eat? How does that make any sense? These are pirates. Even if it wasn't cool or accepted or you're supposed to like treat this devil fruit special, somebody is just going to eat it. And then once they eat it, they're going to leave Pirate Island, they're going to die elsewhere, the fruit is going to respawn somewhere else in the world. It just, that doesn't, it doesn't vibe with me. So I'm assuming that Oda was very intentionally deceptive about what the crown jewel is because we don't actually know what it is yet. So my thought here, guys, is that this might actually be the egg that we see later on Gold Roger's ship. That egg has an origin of some kind, exists somewhere in the world at this time, and maybe it's related to Hachinosu. This event would then be when the Roger pirates obtained it. But yeah, I just straight up like this theory more, but there's still questions. Like, Hachinosu, Pirate Island, as it's described in this chapter, I am having difficulty wrapping my mind around what exactly it is. Like, the culture of Pirate Island 40 years in the past. Shortly after this, we get two really strange panels from Hachinosu, where they say the Rocks Pirates have already set sail. They beat us to it. We've got to get going to hurry up. This is going to shake the pirate world to its core. And I'm assuming that the pirates that we see here are kind of randos. They're not members of Roger Pirates or Rocks Pirates. They're just Hachinosu Pirates. So a detail about the story which comes to mind is we obviously perceive the pirate world, especially in the New World, in a particular way, revolving a lot around the four Yonko. But 40 years in the past, we're not led to believe that there were any Yonko, which would make the New World an entirely different place. Obviously, as one of the lines suggests, like the pirate world is still thriving and strong, but perhaps less organized, composed of far more individual crews. Maybe this is kind of how it had always been before. And the present state of the new world is actually kind of a bastardization of what the pirate world should look like. So assuming that the pirate world had been roughly the same for hundreds and hundreds of years, Hachinosu was a kind of like sacred place for the culture of piracy. And honestly, what I've wanted to speculate for a long time now, and this chapter I think just makes it a little bit easier, is the Pirate Island is the traditional home of Davy Back fights. Honestly, this could be the way that Rox recruited his pirate crew. I mean, we see them in the chapter. I don't want to get ahead of myself, right? But this is an incredible pirate crew. Maybe he didn't recruit them by actually defeating them or because they were really that loyal. He won all of his members in the traditional pirate way. But if there's a stronger, more inherent pirate culture at this time, then it would make more sense for Hachinosu to possess some kind of treasure, crown jewel as they say, that no one is supposed to take. And hell, maybe the thing helps orchestrate the games. Which would also be fitting for a way, because what the Celestial Dragons are doing right now in God Valley is a game of its own sort. Like an evil Davy Backfight. 
But the way that I understand the cut to Hachinosu is that maybe there was a sort of agreement from Pirate Island itself that they would unified go retrieve this sacred jewel because no one crew was supposed to possess it. And in a way, perhaps Hachinosu existed in order to protect the jewel from individual pirate crews. In order to steal it, you would have to defeat all the crews that were present there, ignoring that the world government and the Celestial Dragons somehow came to possess it, which I assume they stole via some shady means. So there was agreement to go take it back together, and the Rocks pirates were the first ones to break this and set sail before everybody else. That's how it makes sense to me at any rate, but I'm keeping an open mind, right? There's still a lot of possibility, and uh, frankly, we might be missing something crucial. But going back to Garb, everything involving him in the chapter was so interesting, even though it was really short. Garp is aware of things that Kong is surprised about, and I think that Oda is hinting about Garp already being in Sword at this point in the story and having connections to the pirate world. For me, this is a big deal because Kong is the fleet admiral of the marines, and if Garp is aware of things because of S.W.O.R.D. that surprise Kong, then I would guess that Kong is not a member of S.W.O.R.D. and that it just, you start to, to paint the lines a little bit about how S.W.O.R.D. operates and how maybe they're really outside of the marines' control. Honestly guys, I think that it is very possible that Garp found its S.W.O.R.D. But anyway, Garp is aware of what the Celestial Dragons did, and also expected the Marines to have some sort of plan to deal with the consequences of it. And apparently, they did plan for this, and maybe they expected the Rocks Pirates to arrive, but they did not expect Roger. Did anyone else find it crazy how much Garp disregarded the Rocks Pirates? This, we see them in the chapter, the pirate crew is incredible, but he's just like, eh, it's not a big deal, you guys, you guys asked for it. And then at the mention of Roger possibly being there, Garp lights up, it's just interesting. I wanna know what was so special about Roger that Garp made the chase his life's mission. Was it the fact that they perhaps acted similarly to the Strahd Pirates in the present timeline, that they were essentially heroes that acted and performed duties that the Marines could not? Like Mihawk says in Marine Ford, Luffy's great power of making friends, the most fearsome ability on the sea. Or was it just the simple fact that Garp knew that Roger would become their king? He just knew it. Either way, I still feel like we have some questions about the circumstances that surround all this. The world government claims that they prepared for a response from the pirate world, but Rox just kind of strolls into the island and clearly they're not going to be able to deal with him. I honestly do not even care that Roger's this hyped up thing that has like somehow changed the circumstances. They're not dealing with Rox and this pirate crew. They're just not. They're, you would need all of the admirals, at least. It makes them look totally incompetent based on what we get in the chapter. Part of me wants to speculate that at this point in the story, the Rocks Pirates and Rocks de Zebec is the new kid on the block. Like think of how Luffy was perceived in the pre-time skip. No one really respected him. Blackbeard calls his ship the Saber of Zebec and seems to be influenced by him in, in some respect. Blackbeard also kind of just came out of nowhere. From a bounty of Zero to Warlord to Yonko in, in a moment. So maybe this mirrors Rocks. Certainly, this would make all of this make a little bit more sense to me. Roger is this established pirate. He's caused chaos everywhere that he's went. The world government really respects him. Whereas Rox is just, you know, they just don't understand yet. But yeah, these comparisons with Luffy as sort of this upcoming pirate really fit for me. In part because Rox is described a lot like Luffy in the chapter. We see Whitebeard say, don't rush ahead, Rox. And since when did I say I'd let an idiot like you give me orders? He also calls him a moron. Rushing ahead is what Luffy specializes in. Being an idiot is what Luffy specializes in. Guys, all I'm saying is don't be surprised when we're finally introduced to Rox officially and he's a lot like Luffy. Like all of this conjures images in my mind of Luffy throughout the story, kind of like randomly asking people to join his crew and just kind of making that happen. Again, Whitebeard says, since when did I say I'd let an idiot like you give me orders? And another member of the crew is referred to as Captain John. Hell, even before this, Big Mom for sure was the captain of a pirate crew. I think that this substantiates the Davy backfight theory that I've already laid out. This is a very strange pirate crew. I'm actually starting to wonder whether Luffy is a combination of the 
character traits or the personality traits of Roger and Rox. It also makes me think of Rox as like the bad future version of Luffy. We're probably going to make a theory about this at some point in time that I'm not sure if I can substantiate it too much, but the idea itself is just intuitively makes sense to me. I'm not going to spoil it here. But I'm sure that some people are going to speculate based on this chapter, it's possible that Brox has Luffy's devil fruit. He has the Gomu Gomu no Mi, or the, the Hito Hito no Mi model Nika. But instead of that, maybe Rox is Luffy, but without the fruit. And the idea is to really highlight how this fruit has changed Luffy's life. And this would work really, really well with this being about Kuma's flashback. Because Kuma pushes out all of Luffy's pain in Thriller Bark and it's massive. We also see Kuma do the same thing in this chapter. And you can see people's personalities change when he does that. The idea then is that pain is capable of warping personalities. And just anecdotally, based on real world experience, I believe this to be true. People in pain are just more irritable, angry. So a theory that I've had for a long time, and I made a video on it just recently. The video reference is Oda finally revealed this hidden power of the Gomu Gomu. Link in the description. But Luffy's pain, which was just incredible, seemed to have no effect on him. And I wonder if his devil fruit is partly responsible for this. Even before Luffy awakened, he had the ability to do things with his body that rubber simply cannot. One of the highlighted examples of this is Luffy's Colverine ability, or Snake Man, how he can sort of bend his arms in weird way. It's just told to us straight up that this is not rubber. Rubber does not work like this. Another really great example is Gear 3rd. Blowing air into your fist does not make your fist like a colossal punch. You just turned your arm into a giant balloon. And maybe it foreshadows that all along Luffy was never a rubber boy. He was a freedom boy. And the initial effect of possessing so much freedom is your body begins to stretch in unusual ways, which creates the impression that you are made of rubber. But then, perceiving yourself as rubber limits the devil fruit. Luffy and others narrow its abilities, when in fact, even before he awakened, Luffy was capable of so much more, so long as he desired it and believed it was possible. This is a really important concept, guys. Luffy is not made of rubber. He's made out of freedom, and this freedom gives him rubber-like attributes. But in reality, he can do whatever it is that he desires and believes to be possible. So Gear 3rd being a massive punch never made any sense, but it made sense to Luffy. Therefore, it was. And likewise, Luffy was capable of some passive things based on his own desires, or possibly also the desires of others. So this actually included the ability to suppress the effect of the accumulated pain. So this actually helped Luffy along his journey and allowed him to maintain himself maybe a little better. And if Rox didn't have this, you could see how there might be a, a bad future version of Luffy. The pain got to be so much that his personality warped. But anyway, I still wanna talk about Rox's crew. I mean, Jesus, all of the little comments from everybody, that made this chapter extra special. And I'm so glad that we got at least a little bit of it. Whitebeard and Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki. Oda makes it pretty clear in this chapter that there's some comparisons to be made between this crew and Luffy's own crew. You can see Whitebeard in a very similar way as Zoro. You can see Shiki in a very similar way as, as Sanji. Big Mom gives some Nami vibes. This comparison I find particularly interesting because of Nami's connection to the Big Mom pirates and Lola. And it's definitely true that what, what part of what makes the Strat so special is that it's accumulation of people that have dreams, strong dreams, desires of their own. It's not all just about Luffy. They're all pursuing something individually. And in this chapter, I got the impression that Rocks and the Rocks Pirates was a little bit more sinister version of the same thing. Likely, probably a better comparison would be Blackbeard. But even still, I think Blackbeard's crew is overall a little bit more evil than this one. So Rox sort of fits in the middle between the purity of the Straw Hats and the, the evil of Blackbeard. But yeah, of course, there is more characters. Gloriosa from, from Amazon Lily. Suddenly, she's hot. Are we supposed to believe that the person that she fell in love with was Whitebeard? That's kind of what I took away from this chapter. It could also possibly be Rox. I only say this because we see Miss Bakken fawning all over Whitebeard and Gloriosa says back off. So maybe it implies that she had a thing for Whitebeard too. Whitebeard was just like, <laughs> the guy. But we also see Captain John, as well as Ochoku, who should both be very familiar to One Piece fans because we have seen them before. We saw them when they were dead in Thriller Park. Also, some eagle-eyed One Piece fans have noticed some other characters in the background, which might also be related to the general zombies of Moria's army. 
And I think that right now, one of the strongest theories about this chapter is that we actually know what became of God Valley. God Valley is located in the West Blue. Thriller Bark was originally located in the West Blue. When you look at some of the architecture of Thriller Bark and then compare it to God Valley, there are similarities. Obviously minus the giant mountain. But with the level of strength of characters here, it's very possible that that island just got demolished. So this creates a story. Moria was also from the West Blue. Whether or not he's involved in God Valley or not, I think that he discovered this island, found some people that actually died there, were buried there, including Captain John and Ochoku. So Moria most likely spent many, many years digging up the island because of how much death occurred there. Valuable corpses and then somehow fitted the island to be capable of sailing and then took it across the Combelt into the Grand Line to possibly continue his research there or otherwise have a base of operations. But yeah, this isn't the only shout out to Thriller Bark and the chapter. I mean, the dang title is uh, Kumashi, which is a pretty familiar word to One Piece fans when thinking about Thriller Bark because you had Perona and Kumashi, the stuffed bear zombie, which is clearly paralleled with Ginny and Kuma. It's also interesting that Perona was essentially a ghost girl. And I think that we can presume, uh, I know we're getting ahead of ourselves here, but you can pretty much presume that Ginny died at some point in this, this flashback. So there, there's like a fitting comparison there. A lot of other people have also pointed out that we have essentially a Ginny zombie present in Egghead. Atlas, Vegapunk's uh, altar is, is very clearly designed based off of Ginny. And that itself could be an interesting story. I also think it's potentially noteworthy that we don't ever see Bonnie really react to Atlas in the way that you might expect if, if Bonnie knew what Ginny looked like or knew her to be, for instance, her mother. But yeah, these comparisons to Thriller Bark here in this chapter is interesting because I made a short the other day, I'll go ahead and link it in the description, which compared the prior chapter also to Thriller Bark. It might be worth a watch. But to me, it is so fitting for God Valley to have become Thriller Bark. Essentially, it became hell or the afterlife quite literally but yeah let's slow it down and back it up i thought that what oda accomplished with the slaves specifically with ivankov and jenny was just really cool oda established jenny as like this master cat burglar and although it isn't exactly spelled out to us i think that we're supposed to assume that the reason the roger pirates have showed up to god valley is because of jenny the roger pirates and not the rocks pirates because the world government said like they stole the thing and that they knew that they would infuriate the pirate world which seems to include rocks. They expected that. They didn't expect Roger. But maybe Ginny was responsible for both being here and that explains why rocks left and the other pirates of Beehive seem to be uh, concerned about that. We continue on and their plan is to steal some of the devil fruit treasures that are present on the island. They know these devil fruits, they know what their powers are and they know that they can utilize them in order to escape, which is just really, really smart. Also the fact that the celestial dragons weren't defending the fruits better is just F. Just aff, man. But the speech from Ivankov about this being their game and that you can't win by playing their game. You, you, have to, you have to break the rules. It just seems so fitting to this story about pirates. Personally, I agree with the notion that in the real world, society is kind of rigged for the few. And then they brainwash you that you have to play by the rules that they set forth in which they are favored. Hopefully, I'm not conveying so much how jaded I am about the way things are, but you know, like... You know, white collar crimes are a thing. Nearly every exorbitantly rich person knows how to skirt the rules for personal gain. But playing this way, more often than not, you're not punished nearly as harshly. Or hell, you can even look at things like Wall Street, how it takes money to make money. The more money that you have, the more dividends that you just passively get from existing with money. I am not condoning lawlessness. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying, look, the, the way society is is evident. And to me, it is just simply true that those who bend or push the rules benefit and those who don't do not. You can even apply this to YouTube, man. I get comments from time to time of like, oh, why does he clickbait so hard? No, this clickbait garbage. But you know, like every big One Piece YouTuber, especially like the very biggest ones right now, they're the ones who've changed the game. Believe it or not, but there was once a time where it was very uncool to put the word revealed in your freaking title. What people do now is just crazy compared to what it once was. And those that have pushed or broken these rules have benefited greatly. Honesty and integrity are only rewarded up to a certain point. Anyway, the game is just rigged. And it's definitely true that society does not want you to know this. And it felt like something akin to what Oda was conveying here. So Ivankov, the free thinker, thought outside of the box. And I love it. 
It was crazy how close Ivankov was to actually eating the mythical dragon Delver. Can you just imagine that? Ivankov as <laughs> your azure dragon? Good God. I'm honestly kind of glad that that was not a thing. Seriously. Although, just imagine how powerful the Deathwink would be if Ivankov was the size of a literal dragon. Also, can we just get some fan art of this, please? I just well, I don't want it in the story, but fan art, yes, absolutely do it. But anyway, Kuma successfully managed to eat the Paul Paul fruit and then utilized the ability to save 500 people. And then the flashback suddenly became so endearing and wholesome. Kuma was such a good boy. Never has the phrase good boy been more accurate than now. Honestly, I'm starting to see the vision of this flashback, or at least I think that I am, and Oda's accomplishing so much here. First off, making Kuma so pure, it's going to hit so much harder, everything that will eventually happen to him, and we know it's going to be a lot. I'm sure that you guys already know, but we're entering Prepare to Cry territory. If we aren't there already, honestly, I've teared up in the last two chapters pretty heavily. But I think that at the same time, Oda is, is, has a narrative purpose for having Kuma be this way. Like, Kuma being a good boy is going to play a role in his backstory. Already we're seeing comparisons between Kuma and Nika. You gotta remember, Nika is this mythological figure, uh, almost Jesus-like. Which is why Kuma is seen in the pre-timeskip carrying a Bible. Likely Kuma's Bible was the story of Nika. So now we have Kuma inspired by Nika. He wants to be like Nika. He wants to free people like Nika. And he has a devil fruit which allows him to perform miracles. In my opinion, this is likely going to result in Kuma becoming a, a sort of religious figure for the Sorbet Kingdom. And this is also, in my opinion, likely why Kuma will become its king. As I imagine it in my mind right now, obviously these things are subject to change. There's a lot of specific details we don't know about Sorbet Kingdom. But I think that a comparison to Drum Island is probable. And Kuma is essentially Dalton. The current king of Sorbet Kingdom is a corrupt, spoiled noble that becomes jealous of the power that Kuma has accumulated from gaining the respect of the people. I straight up would not be surprised if this king puts Kuma on a cross and makes up some reason to justify it. Also, I'm curious to know if Oda might have like a reason to give Kuma sunglasses later in the story. Possibly he loses an eye. But yeah, maybe we shouldn't get so specific, but these are the kinds of thoughts that I have. Maybe Kuma decides not to fight. Maybe the king targets somebody around Kuma. Long story short is, is this is probably going to inspire a rebellion against the king, and they are going to nominate Kuma as their king. Whether Jenny dies before Kuma becomes king of Sorbet or after, we'll see, but I think it could go either way. I also think that it might be likely for the Revolutionary Army to be involved in some way with overthrowing the previous rulers. Certainly, I would expect this flashback to eventually explain how Kuma joins the Revolutionaries. And as they are currently in the story, sort of freeing countries and allowing them to create new leadership, it makes sense to me for this to have occurred before Kuma is king. And maybe they helped encourage this. But we'll see. But yeah, instead of this making everything better, I think it's just for Kuma gonna make everything worse. No good deed goes unpunished. He's he's a, a good doer, a do-gooder. He won't be able to corrupt, and that'll make him a target of the world government. But even beyond that, he's a member of the Buccaneer tribe that we know that the government wants to exterminate. He was also present for God Valley, and we can see in the chapter, I didn't discuss this, he literally met Saturn. So there's no hiding this fact. The world government will not rest until Kuma's past catches up with him. And they will ensure that the world believes him to be a tyrant, when it is very, 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 very obvious, reading this chapter, that Kuma does not have it within him. But yeah, there's also a kind of painful irony as a subtext to this chapter. Ivankov really seems to understand how the world works, um, and is an incredible leader. But before all the action in God Valley, Ivankov's like, look, you can't play by their rules. You can't play their games. And in my opinion, Ivankov takes this to heart. We don't exactly know what happens afterwards, but I presume that Ivankov is shortly going to found Kamabaka Kingdom and become like the first member of the Revolutionary Army along with Dragon. But I'm not sure if this message really resonated with Kuma or that he really understood it. Because ultimately, I think that he's going to continue to play by their rules. And that is what will punish him. The idea that somehow things will end up right if he simply follows the law. Which honestly, you can speculate that he continued to do far past the incident in Sorbet, even to this day becoming a, a warlord and a government experiment. It all just seems like Kuma is not resisting. 
and just praying that the world government is actually going to do what they say they're going to do, which is a poor assumption to make. But while it's obviously going to cause Kuma a lot of suffering, at the same time it's very fitting. While Oda right now is comparing Kuma to Nika, another character I think that we can compare to Nika and Luffy is Odin, and Odin's story reflects this, and establishes the point of hope. Odin, the same as Kuma, suffered for years under the premise that Orochi would eventually fulfill his promise. And Odin waited patiently, and fulfilled his end of the bargain, all the way to the end. While the people thought Odin to be a fool, I think it's going to be the same with Kuma, where we as readers, at the very least, might consider Kuma to be a fool. But I also think that this is like an important message of the story. Doing things right will eventually be rewarded. Eventually in this life or the next. In my opinion, this is a very profound and powerful mindset that may also be related to the lore of Joy Boy and Nika. But yeah, I suppose the only thing left that we have to speculate is, of course, Bonnie. Bonnie's role in all this, where does she arrive, Kuma and Jenny, it's just absurdly likely at this point in time. You should know that, absurdly likely, that Jenny is Bonnie's mother and that Kuma is actually her father. I'm gonna hold my thoughts until we get more of this flashback, but while I think that this is absurdly likely, everyone should believe it to be true. It doesn't have to be true. I may be reaching a little bit because you guys know I've got a theory that Bonnie is the thing which hatched from the egg, which we talked about at the beginning of this. It's a really tinfoil idea. It's even more tinfoil now. I'm stretching for it. But yeah, let's see more of the flashback and I might comment on this more. The biggest thing that I want though is to understand why everyone refers to Bonnie as a child in the present storyline if she was potentially born 20 years ago. She's now actually an adult. Just a weird little detail. But anyway, guys, once again, an amazing chapter. Did I want to see more from the God Valley flashback? Of course I did. But what we got was plenty. We're riding high right now with One Piece. Oda is cooking. And at the same time, I'm thankful because I'm also excited for what's happening in the present events of the story. So being a little bit closer to that also feels good as well. But yeah, as always, let me know what you thought about the chapter, whether you know something that I might have missed, just share your thoughts. Remember to check out my books, The Booms. Volume 3 is out, and if you guys happen to read them, just leave a review. Let other people know what you think about them. Honestly, it's really important. Even if you have criticisms, I'd be curious to know what those are so that I can learn and grow. But you guys already know, like the video, subscribe, click the bell to be notified, join the squad, and as always, have a wonderful day.